Hey, hey, everybody. Good afternoon. I, uh, I am super excited to bring to you uh, another TC Collective interview in what I'm calling a mentor series. And uh, today we're heading south. We're talking to the lovely Michelle Martinez. Uh, down in uh, Miami, Florida, and um, excited to share her story with you to let you get an idea of some of the things that she's been through. Again, similar but different than uh, than Sam last week, and you know, going to be similar but different than some of the things that we're going to learn from some other TCs that we're going to be chatting with in the next few weeks. So, one of the first things that I love to do is ask people their story, and um, you know, how did you get involved in real estate, Michelle? How did you not just get involved in real estate, but how did you find this, like, this little niche that we're in coordinating transactions? Um, so, and I'm fourth generation in real estate. Whew, um, girl. So that is like, I was born under a very big umbrella of real estate. Okay. Um, when I got to this country from Dominican Republic, I was born in the States, but my family shipped me over to DR for my uh, formative beginning learning year. So at least I had Spanish down pack. And when I got here when I was seven, uh, I learned English with my mom showing houses. So it was literally like oh. terrazzo floors, double doors. And I was like, I got this. <laughs> that's so funny. I love it. But at the end of it all, it was. Uh, I wasn't the type to go out showing houses. So around 15, when I was helping my mom with her files, she opened her brokerage and um, I was doing appointment setting for her and just getting things in the paperwork world for her prepared. Um, I was like, yeah, I could do this. I can be behind a phone all day long. Yeah. Now that was all the way in 1995. MLS was still a book here in South Florida. Yeah, uh, half part book and some DOS things were starting again on the computer. Yeah. And um, it was quite interesting through all these years to see the the basically how everything has si shifted and transitioned from paper to computer. Yeah. And um, and, uh, and, uh, um, and the length of the contract, because I started out in Florida, too. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Back when you started, it was a legal size sheet of paper front and back. And now it's like 15, 16 pages with a bunch of addenda and, and so forth added to it. So um, Exactly, exactly. Yeah. The first paper, I was like, oh, this is easy. Check, check, check. Yeah. And now it's like every lawsuit gives you a new clause. <laughs> that's, this is true. And that's, and that's something um, for sure that as a transaction coordinator, you know, that, that makes it important for us to pay attention to what's changing in our contracts, what's changing with our agents, and then, of course, you know, the industry as a whole. And obviously, you know, being a fourth generation in real estate, I mean, tell me about that. I mean, so were your, was your family in real estate sales and in the DR or just here in the States? Or I, I got to know more about that. Well, it's like my great, how was it again? My great, great grandmother was investment sales in Dominican Republic. Like literally everybody says, like, if you drop a coconut, we probably own it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, as you, everyone was in the investment sales aspect of it, uh, once you got into my grandmother, there were in sales, my mother, my aunts, everyone is in wow. sales. Wow. So it's like there were in some aspect of real estate, but now it's more concentrated sales. And so with some of the family members and others are in the background, like myself and my sister, who owns also a transaction coordination business. Awesome. So, so some of us in the background and someone, some of us are in the forefront with the public. So it's, so it's in your blood. And much like Sam was saying, like, you know, you probably almost had to have a real estate license to still be able to be a part of the family. Right. Or at least like, in real estate. Dinner talk. <laughs> yeah. wow. every, time, every time everybody had something to say. <laughs> That's so funny. And you grew up in it. You know, my daughter did too. I remember years ago, she was at the house looking out the window and she saw somebody walking around with a clipboard. And, you know, our neighbor hadn't had their home for sale or anything. And she looked at me and she goes, Mom, I think they're getting an appraisal. She was like nine. Like, how did my nine-year-old <laughs> know that? And it's the same way. She grew up with it just like you. Yeah. yeah. So 
obviously in the last however many years that is, 20 something years, you've seen a lot. Um, different, markets, different cycles, different situations. Um, you've been through uh, obviously some storms down there, things that have impacted business. Um, Tell me a little bit about that, and, and and more importantly, you know what you have done personally and professionally to stick with it during those frustrating and challenging times. Well, it's interesting because when we went to, let's see, in the late '90s here in South Florida, we had a small, kind of like a bubble burst. Yeah. In, in our community, so um, I'm in the area of West Kendall, okay. and in West Kendall. Uh, uh oh, your mic popped out. Hold on. Hold on, Michelle. Michelle, you're muted. Hang on. You muted yourself. Michelle. Hold on, guys. I'm fixing her. Uh, hey, hon. Michelle. And Kat, um, there was no financing available. We had really high interest rates at that time. So it's funny that I remember that from when I was 11 and 12 with my mom. Because at the end of the day, when we went into it, when I was a little bit more older um, in 2008, when we had the next, well, it was nationwide yeah. um, shift in market with um, short sales and REO becoming a huge part of the, of the market. Um, I remembered those earlier days and I was just like, okay, we kind of went through this like in a small way. There's a markets that just went, values just dropped like 70%. Oh. And it's the newer markets that, um, that got hit the most because they weren't established yet. So it was okay. always like, I learned from my mom. My yeah. mom had to learn how to shift really quickly and be flexible. So we can't, control those things outside of us, but we can control what we can do with our own two hands. And it's gain as much education as quickly as possible to help the public because yeah. you're already involved. You just need to know what that next area where you can help is. So with that in tow, what happened in 2008 for us, I mean, at that point, our company was huge. My mom had a brokerage that was pretty big in South Florida, and we also had a lending uh, institution. We were correspondence lenders as well. Gotcha. And so we couldn't finance anything. We couldn't uh, sell anything. We couldn't do anything. It was just the most impactful thing that happened to me during that process was, I just remember it so vividly, we couldn't close a single deal, and an FBI truck showed up in the parking lot of our shopping plaza and we were had our wise eyes wide open we're like what is going on now in our plaza there was like at least a good 10 real estate brokerages and like eight lending houses yeah and uh wow. but we had the huge building in the front and they parked in front of our office and we're like oh my god sweating so hard and we just saw the fbi agents coming out and going around our building to the back to the upstairs offices and behind us. And we were praying so hard, oh my God, what is going on? And we just saw them taking out computers and files and, uh, and, uh. and file cabinets from the lending houses and the real estate. Almost all of the offices got shut down that day, except wow. ours. We wow. were just thanking God that we were blessed, that yeah. that didn't happen to us. But that was such an impactful moment. After that, our office, our offices closed that month. Mm. But we didn't have any legal issues. Yeah. So we were just like, okay. What we did was we transferred into a KW umbrella that was absorbing all of the uh, smaller brokerages, as they called it, from the community yeah. and yeah. all the agents that were coming in. So that's how we got our agents back to work. They started with property management and doing short sales. Now, in 2008, 2009, they weren't very popular, and it took forever to get approvals. <laughs> it never got them. Uh, yeah, I remember those days. Tell me real quick, though, what was your longest short sale? I mean, it's it's sort of like comparing war wounds. Uh, it, I mean, we've had some there that were almost two or three years. Yeah. It was that bad. Oh. And uh, it, people didn't lose their house before then. 
Yeah. So it was just one of those things that we had to be like on top of the education that was coming through from the boards and just be involved in the process of learning as we were going. Because the banks were learning as well. They had these departments where that weren't really operational. They were just available because they had to be there. And now they had to be maintained, uh, house more employees and train them in order to do this job. And it took them a year or two to get there for themselves. And that's an interesting thing that you mentioned about the banks had to change, the agents had to change. So obviously you in your business had to change and the work that you did and the people that you supported, it became a totally different looking uh, beast, if you will, a totally different looking thing. And, you know, there's a lot of conversation sometimes in our group about, well, here's what I do and here's only what I do and this is how I run my business and I'm all for all of us, you know, doing things sort of our way, but when the market shifts, and you said that so well, that was beyond your control, and so right. you're, you're, you had to be flexible and, and sort of roll with it, um, and, and, and tell me then, how, how do you keep going during those challenging times, and I don't really want to harp a whole lot on the doom and gloom, because it really was, I mean, we all came out of it, we came yeah. out of it on the other side. Market shifts happen. You know, uh, what we saw in 2008 happened before in the early 90s. So, I mean, it, it, you know, but, but, so, but so where I'm going with that is, like, I don't want to really harp on all the negative, but I want to just share with people when things shift and, you know, they aren't really going our way. What did you do personally? Personally, I went outside of real estate, so to speak. Okay. I went more into valuations at that point, and I was working with a company that was helping people reduce their property taxes at that point, in all honesty, because yeah. in my community, what ended up happening as we were doing these short sales and trying to do these foreclosure prevention, most people, it was incredible. At least, I would say 40% of homeowners were losing their houses because they were being forced to have escrow accounts now, and the taxes were more than the mortgage. Yeah. The insurance was more than the mortgage. So I went, I was like, okay, see a need, fill a need. This right here, I can help. I can overcome this market, and I'll gain more knowledge. Very nice. So I went into property tax appeals with an appraiser, and I learned so much with them for those I would say it was like four years wow. that I was with them helping people appeal their property taxes and they would be able to afford their homes and basically adjust or readjust their, their financial standpoint with the banks. Because it's like, okay, now I can afford you. <laughs> That's you know, interesting. Why? Yeah. So, so it's, it's a lot of the same process. We have a task list. We have certain things we need to do. We're just doing it in a different um in a different arena if you will almost right. yeah, yeah that's real interesting and i and i love that you just you were talking about see a need fill a need and that's something really important for us all to remember um you know it, especially if it, it is in alignment with the things that we actually uh, really enjoy the, the behind the scenes the spending the time on the computer or looking at the documents or being on the phone um so You've probably worked with a wide variety of people in all of these years, some fantastic agents, some not so fantastic agents. Um, tell me, you know, if you've ever had to fire a client, and if so, how did that go for you? What, what was that like? Um, I think I haven't yet had to fire a client. Okay. Um, so far, I've been very blessed that because I do meet with every client first, yeah. I sit there with them and basically I feel like when we press the flesh, I get more of an instinct if we can work together or not and basically avoid some headaches because I want to set the expectation up front of how our working relationship or more like I call it our working partnership is going to work. We're yeah. going to both help each other grow our business. But in order for that to happen, we need to like each other, we need to understand each other, and we need to communicate well because things will be happening in such a pace that there has to be these boundaries of you know what you have to do, I know what I have to do, and we're working in a symbiotic relationship to get that there. 
Very so, good. So far, I have not had to fire anybody, but I have been prone to hold on to people more than I need to, okay. um, especially if I see them um, starting to uh, work more on the side of doing things and not really thinking about it. And I'm here like, well, you know what, at this point, I need to protect you and me, and I'm going to tell you about it. But now we seem to have this conversation at least every couple of months. And uh, that's why I'm here like, okay, I don't mind coming back and telling you, hey, we need to do this a little bit more this way because that protects you and me. Um, but at the end of the day, I, since we have that relationship already established, I just come at them from that side as like, you know, I'm calling you as a friend that we need to be like this when it comes to this transaction or with any of your clients. That way we don't leave ourselves open for anything in the future. And, uh, and that's a really good thing. I, I want to just kind of unpack a little bit of what you said at the very beginning of that section there, uh, answering that question. You, you talk about meeting with them and really going into detail the things that you're going to do, the expectations you have for them, uh, making sure then, of course, that you, you know, set forth what you're going to do so that you can, I like to say, exceed someone's expectation rather than frustrate them because they thought you were going to do this. And in fact, they you didn't because you didn't even know that that was something they were thinking. So um, if you don't mind, would you just share with us a little bit of that process? And is that after an agent has said, yes, Michelle, I, I'd love to have you be my TC, or is that like part of your your sales process, if you will, your education process. Yeah, it's part of the my sales process. Okay. Because I have learned from the past, not everyone is for you. Amen. <laughs> and I'm not going to waste my time that is very precious, nor your time. And if I feel that in that first meeting, we're not going to click, so to speak. Yeah. And I think that it's best that I send you to someone that will probably deal better with your personality than um, frustrate you or myself. Yeah. And let's avoid that at the end of the day. That's a really good thing that you mentioned there too, that not everybody is uh, the right fit for you um, or me or anybody else. And, you know, making a referral, passing them on to somebody who you think can help them, maybe not just from a personality standpoint, but I would assume that there's probably some things that you've been asked to do that really are outside of the scope of what it is that you want to provide as services, but you do know somebody who does that. Maybe, you know, it's, it's a runner service slash TC versus just being a TC or, or something like that. Is that correct? Right. If they have uh, certain demands that they need to have, and I'm just like, you know, I'm already to what capacity I can work with and yeah. what I can do, um, then at that point, I'm not going to be there adding an extra service that if someone should ask, I always believe this one thing, and that is what I do for one, I have to do for all. So yeah. if I tell someone, what I'm doing for you, I'm doing it eh, for these other people as well. So it's not going to be any different. If I have to stop what I'm doing to do something different, it's going to trip me off. And then I'm not going to be on my A game with everybody else who I've made promises to. Yeah. So at that point, it's kind of like, yeah, I can't help you with that one thing <laughs> or second thing or third thing. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good point that you bring up, and and I'm and I hope everyone got that. That you know, part of what we have to do is is somewhat systemize it so that you know we are offering similar services to all of the people that we work with, so that we can streamline what we do in order to provide the best service to all the folks that we're working with. So thank you for for saying that, Michelle. Um, I want to talk a little bit about marketing and, you know, you're an independent transaction coordinator. Um, tell me a little bit about the way that you've grown your business, the people, you know, how you've been able to market and, and sell your services, if you will. And, um, I mean, obviously that comes with a lot of freedom and flexibility, but it also comes with responsibility being independent. You know, we have to promote and market and, and so forth ourselves. Share with us a little bit of, you know, what, what you found over the years has worked for you. What has worked for me has really been uh, joining referral networks, being part of the association. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big one for me because it's like uh, when, even when I'm not there, which yeah. is funny, 
my referral sources are talking to me with other agents. Ah. Through the association, since I've made contacts, I'm big on pressing the flesh. I'll be with anybody wherever I need to be. So yeah. it's like they already know me. They've seen my face. They've smelled me. They enjoy <laughs> me. So they remember me. And yeah. they're like, oh, you know, I know someone for you. And it's funny. The other day, I even received a text from a title connection that I have. And they're like, I'm here at Parrot Jungle at this event. And people are talking about you. How did that happen? And I'm here like, who is it, if I if you can tell me? And um, that way I can tell them thank you. Yeah. And, and it's just like, that's how it happens. Word of mouth has been really big for me. At the beginning, I had tried email marketing through the association and things like that. But it's like, I feel that when people already know you, they've already um, have a relationship with you. It's just so much more easier for your name to be carried from mouth to mouth so to speak. And that I felt has had more weight in the growth of my business. I haven't marketed in a couple of months and I'm still getting calls almost daily. Hey, I received your recommendation from X, Y, and Z realtor of this brick brokerage. And I would like to work with you, or I was working with you on the other side and I have a couple of people that want to work with you. And that's just literally how it's been going. Wow. And, and, and I, I, I love that you just said, you know, you get out, you meet people, and it's not just real estate agents that you're going out and you're networking with. It's people that are in your industry and, and probably in other industries, I would assume some of those networking events as well. But your title person saw value in what you offered and told someone about it. Um, that's huge, people. I mean, and that's that's, you know, it, it, there's a saying that it's much easier to sell to people who know, like, and trust you. But I think the same thing goes, uh, you know, holds true. It's, it's much easier for you to grow a business when you are delivering the kind of service that people want to refer to, as well as you're working on staying connected to those people uh, via your association, those networking events, um, whatever other uh, activities you do to stay connected to those people do you have any any magic that you offer there? You know, uh, this person, you, you mentioned who was it so you could thank them. Tell me a little bit more about how you nurture those relationships, not just show up for events. Right, because at the end of the day, I like to talk to my agents every week. Mm -hmm. um, not just because I'm, I'm big on uh, being connected with them and continuing to follow up with them on, oh, how's the kids doing? Yeah. This one just went to prom. How did it go? And this, that, and the other. And I'm here like very involved in their lives outside of the, um, the real estate transaction because that relationship has to be there. And it's more than just, oh, we're just doing this one thing together. No, it's like, no, we're going to be together for a while. And I want to know when's the birthdays? When are you having this going on in your life? Oh, it's your anniversary. I'm going to send you guys some flowers. Or I'll just send you a thank you a card letting you know, hey, thank you very much for letting people know about me. I really appreciate you. And you're really helping me grow my business. And I know that this is what we promised to each other, but you're going above and beyond for me. And I will always go above and beyond for you. It's just showing that appreciation in every way because human beings like to be acknowledged. Yes. I like it. So everybody else must like it too. <laughs> no, so, you're absolutely right. That's a really good point that you make. It's, yeah. it's, you know, for after a while, I mean, people will give. They want you to grow your business. They want to help you. But if you don't acknowledge it or reciprocate it or thank them for it, you know, even if you did get that agent that they referred and you did good work for them, they're going to, that's going to eventually, your referral source is going to dry up. So it's really important that you nurture those relationships, both with your agents and, of course, with your referral sources. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely. Huge. That's definitely. Huge. Um, to all of their things. I'm here like, oh, you need me there? I'm there. I'm yeah. there. Yeah. I'm the party. I'm coming. What do you need me to bring? Hooch? That's, Got it. <laughs> that's so awesome. So then you are more of an extrovert, and it sounds like you love to go out and do those kind of events. One, people would say that, but um, I'm more of an introvert. I just pump myself up really well. <laughs> ah, thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. Because a lot of people are intimidated by those events. So I just have to ask you, you've been doing them for a while, um, and I'm going to kind of go off of our questions here and into this other lane, but tell me, 
what would be your best advice for somebody showing up at one of those events? Um, never done it. All right. So, you know, I say bring a buddy the first time. Okay. Um, grab some wine if you drink. Okay. Um, it really helps you calm down. <laughs> and when you see circles um, starting, join in. Yeah. And um, because it's very easy to become a wallflower and not do anything. So it's like you, you have to give yourself the mindset, okay, I'm with a friend, so I'm calm. I have a drink, I'm calmer. <laughs> yeah. And now let me talk to others that are not people that I would usually talk to. So it's, you know, in a networking event, usually it's about business. People are very business oriented so they want to tell you what they're all about already they just need an opening so you give that to them because yeah. eventually it will come to you so you go up and you're like if they're laughing you're laughing because it's funny be authentic please yeah but if it's not funny you just look confused and you go what just happened and let someone explain it to you and that's also an opening yeah. <laughs> but it's um just being present in the moment and Turn to the person on your right that didn't come with you and say, hi there, my name is Michelle. What's your name? That's it. Mm, yeah. So it's, 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 it's start. And yeah. you just go through the circle. <laughs> I love it. So let me just ask you or correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it's sort of pushing yourself to do something that's not totally awful, but just maybe a little outside of your comfort zone. Um, and on top of that, it's really expressing an interest in what someone else is doing, knowing that they will ask you then in return. Yes. Awesome. That's usually what happens. You let people talk and they will talk your ear off and then your time comes because they want that you're in a specific situation where it's kind of like there is an expectation already within the group that this is how it's going to go. Yeah. But most people don't get spoken to because they are actually a little bit of a wallflower too, but they want to chat. So yeah. you kind of like make an effort yourself. You know, I just have to do this at least, yeah. at least. Yeah. Um, a good thing that I used to do before events, uh, eventually I started going by myself um and i would sit in the car and i, I have what you're music. gonna say i love it i do the same thing i have music in the car and i start singing it i pump myself yeah. up and i'm here like and then um there is um oh my god what is her name chanel cooper sykes she mm -hmm. calls it uh a rant Okay. And, she, and you don't do like a negative rant because you can rant all day on the negative, but you do like a positive rant yeah. and you sit there and you pump yourself up with this positive rant. And you're just saying all the amazing things that are coming from this day yeah. or so you just start establishing things that already happened so that you are like, yeah, this good thing already happened. And then you go into what you want to happen so that the flow of the energy keeps increasing. So that when you get out of the car, you're like, yes, let's do this. I'm, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm going to meet somebody. They're going to be awesome. We're going to have a great connection, yada, yada. Yeah. Awesome. That yeah. is so cool. Thank you so much for sharing that because I do know that networking events can be intimidating for a lot of people. And, yeah. and I appreciate you not only telling us that's where you had success, and, and it can be, you know, they don't have to be expensive, but, but that's not only where you've had success, but that it wasn't sort of like your natural thing, but you have adopted and, and put yourself out there and it's paid off. Um, tell me this, I love to know this question. Looking back on your early years in business, what would you go back and tell yourself then that you know now that you would could share with some of those that are listening this afternoon? I think um, the big one for me uh, was this is the second company that I've opened as a transaction coordination business. Okay. My first business, I opened it with my soon-to-be ex-husband. Okay. And I think that I would have told myself in the earlier years, don't partner with your husband. <laughs> okay. Because that for me, um, it created unnecessary paperwork to dissolve things that shouldn't have been dissolved. And if I would have just been mine, I could have gone on in my life with what I had before with no, with no need to uh, look 
or establish any kind of differences with my ex-husband. To me, that was the big thing for me. I mean, yeah. partner, any partner, even if it's your spouse, your sibling, or family member or friend, or a stranger, when you go into a partnership with anybody, um, try to make sure that it's not only an equal partnership, but it's always convenient for you. And it's not only about the beginning, but the long haul. What are the plans for the future? And it was something that uh, I remembered when I was going through the process. I was like, you know what? I should have reverse engineered this for the just in case. What would happen if this doesn't last? Yeah. Do I really want this when I was making the choice? And it would have been a more uh, moment of reason than in a moment of emotion when gotcha. I started the company before. So that's one of those things that I did learn from that process is always reverse engineer what you're doing so that you know that how is that going to impact me in 5, 10, 15, 20 years and what are the things that could happen that I need to protect myself from and right. so to speak so that I know am I prepared to handle that? Do I want to do that if it does come to pass? And I've asked myself the question so I am better prepared. Great advice. That learned. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice and something that we all could learn from and learn and I know you've learned from it and and uh, and and will grow and do things differently because of those lessons. So thank you for sharing that with us. And you're right, reverse engineering is is absolutely important. Um and and you know, having an attorney or somebody draft those things for us can can also help us, you know, to strategize with that. Um let's let's talk about this real quick. Tell me what is the thing that you like most about what you do? And I'm going to also ask you, what's the thing that you like the least? Um, all right. So, I mean, the thing that I like the most is that there is a beginning and an end. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so satisfied at the end. It's file closed, everything compliant. Everything is just, oh, I could put a pretty pink bill in it and it's perfect. Yeah. I love that part that it's like, I know exactly what's going to happen, when it's supposed to happen, and it happens. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Close the book. On to the next. Yeah. So it's like the process as a whole is my is like a blessing to me because I love that things end and it's cordial and everything is happy. Even if we have problems at the end, it's done. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. I'm not carrying that. That's someone else's business. But right. Um, that is the thing that I love the most, that the beginning and the end is defined, we did it, we, everybody celebrate, keep it moving. Um, the thing that I dislike, uh, you know, running into some people that are not exactly out for the best interest of all, but uh, more for their own convenience. Gotcha. Um, when we run into certain uh, types of it could be anybody, but anybody on the other side of the transaction, that's not, or it could even be your own customer's client. That yeah. is not the best, but you sit there and you go, you know what? We have a job to do. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to like you. I just have to do the job. So um, those are the things that's like when you deal with certain people that are just not uh, of integrity is why yeah. we use the word. It's like you have an agreement, but you want to do things your way and you'll get it no matter what. Though that's the the ones where I'm here like, oh, they're gonna be that kind of file. Thanks. Yeah, yeah those are those are definitely frustrating when 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 that lack of integrity though bleeds into the ethics violations, that's when like, you know, I'm all done. I'm sure you are the same way. Uh, I have tattled to my agents many times because somebody involved in the process has definitely bent the rules so far that they're breaking them, in my opinion, but it just mm -hmm. leaves sort of a bad taste for everyone involved in the process. Um, and um, I'm with you. Those are the frustrating ones. You know, if we all really just focused on helping this buyer or seller accomplish their goal, and that was all of our primary focus, it would be a much better process for, I think, everyone. Michelle, 
I want to ask you just one more question before we wrap up today. But before I do, I want to really say thank you. I've, I've learned a lot more about you. It's been fun getting to see your pretty face on our uh, Facebook group this afternoon. I do appreciate all of the feedback that you've uh, shared in the group as well. There's been a lot of questions I know that you've posted uh, answers to and helped others. So thank you. Um, any other words of wisdom, though, that would be my question that you want to share with those that are watching this. Um, words of wisdom, I think when it comes to having your own business, mm. I see this question so much and I'm always telling people, you know what, it's yours. <laughs> yeah. What do you want? And, you know, it's so easy to um, think small for yourself. Okay. And uh, sometimes you may not want to believe for bigger in your life or that you're worth more or that you can ask for more. Mm. And if that is the case for you, I have gone through that myself. And I can only tell everybody that it's all for you. So what you believe you're worth, what you believe you want, what you desire for you it's all good yeah you have everything at your disposal at your fingertips to have the very best and you deserve it mm. but it starts with you you have to want and desire that so much that you go for it so yeah. always start with you and know what it is that you want where you want to go and where you want to be and then everything else will just grow from there. If you start with a small dream, but it turns big, great. That's awesome. If you feel like small is where you want to be, that's if you want to define it as small. I don't define anything as small or big, but people like to use those words. Yeah. This is for you. This is your life. And however you want it to be, it's perfect just the way it is. Yeah. And don't let anybody else define it for you. Everybody's entitled to their own version of success. And what I would also add, and I think you were saying it in there, but I want to just say it because I want everybody to hear it, is comparison kills. So whatever it is that you want, believe it, it's possible, um, own it, if you will, but don't compare yourself to others because that can just rob us all of our dreams um, it's where our focus is. That's where, where our attention is, our focus is. That's where all of it goes. So spiraling out of, uh, in places we don't need to spiral in. Stay in your lane. Pay attention to you. And, uh, you know, I'm going to just quote Sam from last week's interview is that we are our most valuable assets. And um, I think you were, were saying a lot of the uh, very similar things there about you know, um, growing your business your way and doing it the way that you want it. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you hanging out this afternoon and being a part of this mentor series. And uh, mm -hmm. again, I appreciate all the, the times you've jumped in on Facebook and answered some questions. And it was a pleasure getting to see you personally today. Thanks again for being here. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate you. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.